a sorcerer. But I'll gladly test your steel. Old friend. Welcome to the Rest of Your Orbis channel, and today we're going to be exploring the trolley, or forbidden transit. Now, why would we classify a trolley as a forbidden transit system? We see many examples of trolleys in our various explorations, and yet, for whatever reason, despite the fact that our society is focused on achieving cleaner, greener energy now in this contemporary era, we seem to have forgotten about the trolley in a lot of respects. I remember how I was first exposed to the trolley. It was on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I always remember the trolley coming in. That was the very first time I saw one in my life because there were certainly no, no trolleys in the Midwest United States where I grew up in. Now, if you grew up in San Francisco or somewhere else, you saw the trolley. What exactly is the official historical account behind the trolley? Well, here in this image from Washington, D.C., we're seeing how the trolleys operated. We're told that trolleys began as horse-drawn vehicles, especially in Europe in the early 1800s. And I'm also going to refrain from using 19th and 20th century, as that can be a little confusing. So in the early 1800s, this is what we had, horses that pulled trolleys around. Now, it is possible for horses to do this, although is this the most efficient arrangement? And why on earth would you want to establish a vehicle or something like this, the streetcar? Trolleys are also called trams, and I know some people get very wrapped around the bend about exactly what you're supposed to call it, but they're known as trams, trolleys, streetcars. The whole concept, though, of having horses pull trolleys is quite intriguing because it seems as though it'd be a little bit of a logistical challenge because you have all those animals in a small amount of space, and then, of course, those animals do things, such as defecate, and you have to remove the defecation. And we often talk about that in our early images of the cities. There's also the challenge of the animals uh, having limitations on them. Now, our official history tells us that over time, eventually, the trolleys evolved with an electrical system, and some were even gas-powered in due time. But an intriguing aspect that we see in these trolleys, in these old images, that they had a lot of different uses. And there also seems to be something, dare I say, out of place with having horses pull these trolleys around. Now, the whole concept of having train tracks with wheels and very limited contact space between the wheels and the tracks is the very principle behind the train and why a train does not take that much tractive force to pull a large or heavy vehicle. So that's why I say it's possible that horses could do it. But as time went on, they evolved and then they adapted the electrical system. And we've seen the trolley in many of our explorations that we've done. Now, what we believe, and what a lot of our mainstream historical accounts will tell us, is that the trolley only operated in the major cities. Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, the other major cities of the United States and Europe, and elsewhere in the land that employed the trolley. It was a very efficient mass transit system, and it allowed people to get around the city. But would you be surprised to know that the trolley was not confined to the large cities? Excuse me, large cities, as they were at that time? For example, here we have the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, and we looked at that building before, and here we see many trolleys or streetcars or trams lined up, along with some horses. Quite a parade going on, and a very interesting image that provides different clues. Now just imagine, though, if you had trolleys, not just in every city, but also in the small towns. Now you might be asking, well, Aurelian, I think you're going a little too far out there because why would there be trolleys in small town USA or small town Europe? Well, would you be surprised to know that we do actually have some documentation, so you could say it is quote unquote well documented, that we have trolleys that were used in small towns. And not just any small towns, but some of the smallest towns in the United States. And small towns that were small in the 1800s, and they're still small to this day. In fact, when we look around here, we see in Tama, Iowa, we have a trolley. Now, this is interesting because Tama, Iowa, a town of only a couple thousand people, it's always been a small town and likely always will be a small town, they have a picture of a trolley next to their major hotel, which is concealed by these trees here in this image, and very interesting image that it is. I recall seeing a postcard, though, where it said that the trolley was added later, a postcard of Tama, Iowa, as it is. But there's also other towns around the Midwest, small towns that seem to employ the trolley. Now, why exactly would these small towns need the trolley? And not to be derogatory towards Tama, Iowa, but frankly, I could run through that town in just a few minutes on feet. Why exactly do you need a trolley to go through Tama, Iowa? 
or a trolley in some of these other towns, whether you're in Wisconsin, Missouri, or even the small towns in Virginia, as it is, again, well documented that trolleys operated in these small towns. Now, let's think about this. If this was a trolley transit system, would it just operate in the small town? Or would it actually be part of a larger system? For example, here we're in Appleton, Wisconsin. Hmm, Appleton. I wonder if one of those individuals pictured there is Willem Dafoe's grandfather, as Willem Dafoe is from Appleton, Wisconsin. In fact, could one of those individuals be Willem Dafoe? Isn't it amazing how often that guy seems to crop up, Mr. Michelangelo himself? Anyway, back on topic. We have the trolley, though, in many small rural communities. And what I'm suggesting is perhaps the trolley infrastructure was a lot more extensive than we're led to believe. Perhaps it was really the mass transit system, especially in the United States and quite likely Europe as well, where we had all the communities connected. And it worked quite well and quite efficiently. Now, we think about our theories of a previous civilization that no doubt used the trolley system. And if you think about it, if you have a mass transit system that facilitates rapid transport from the rural areas to the cities, suddenly it completely changes the dynamic of how your cities operate with your population. A lot of people have asked me questions in terms of how populated do I think the cities in the old world or the previous civilization really were? Well, we don't know. And we also have to consider the fact that if we had the ability to achieve rapid transit from the rural areas to the cities, and it was feasible, and you were able to do it without having gridlock or vast amounts of traffic and the inability of people moving from small rural communities to cities in a rapid amount of time, it completely changes the dynamic of a civilization. Now just imagine if you did have a reliable mass transportation system. Now it is true that we do have some examples and we will be exploring the subway in due time, especially the New York City subway. But you can see where mass transit would work as opposed to say Los Angeles where you don't really have an effective mass transit system and you're reliant on your car. Although ironically when we look at the mainstream account for the official demise of the trolley, we'll see that the car or the automobile, as Mr. Worf would say, had a lot to do with it. Some of these images though really strike our imaginations because we're able to see how the trolley affected life at that time and how different that would have been. And if you think about it, let's just say you live in a small town and you're able to jump on the trolley and then 20 minutes later you're in downtown Chicago. That has a completely different look. Now, we can compare and contrast this to what we have with the subway in New York City, where you're up on 110th and Cathedral, you hop on the subway, and then the next thing you know, you're on Fifth Avenue. Okay, there's a few stops, but it's relatively efficient and it works very well. Nice building here in the background of this particular image. So we see so much with a lot of these trolleys, and we can get an idea of what capability they had. Here's an image from Hurley, Wisconsin. Now, Hurley, Wisconsin is not a very large populated town population of maybe 1,500 to this day, and certainly not ever exceeding that, and yet they had a trolley that ran right through the town. Quite interesting. Not only did they have a trolley, they also had a very nice county courthouse there as well, with a rather castle or manor-like appearance to it as well. Although it's no longer a courthouse, it's now a museum, at least we can take comfort or solace in the fact that it still stands as a museum. I would like to visit this one as well. Indeed, Hurley's been added to my explorations list. And not only did they have trolleys, they apparently also had a trolley that had a snow removal capability. What a novel idea! So, an electric-driven vehicle in a very small town, nice building again, in Hurley, Wisconsin. Not a very large town, and yet they had the ability to employ trolleys. And not just trolleys or streetcars, but also in a snow removal capacity. Unfortunately, the trolley eventually vanished, and here we have the last streetcars operating in Detroit. And in our exploration of Detroit, we certainly saw what an incredibly beautiful city it was in the past. And so we can see that for whatever reason, the trolleys were removed from the urban areas. And then we ask, well, why exactly were the trolleys removed from the smaller towns? And the answer will be, well, if they were removed from the urban areas, and the infrastructure and the financial support to continue them just simply wasn't there. We're going to take a closer look, though, at what our official account is for why we decided to remove trolleys from our mass transportation system. I mean, if you really think about this, an electric, electrically driven vehicle, and we can see the trolley map here in Atlanta, Georgia. Isn't this intriguing, though, because we also see this 1902 map showing the trolley lines in Atlanta, Georgia, or the streetcars, or the trams. And we also see the town of Decatur, 
Although when we recall our Atlanta exploration, we might remember that Decatur was established before Atlanta was. Very interesting. When we see these images though, it's very obvious that they still use the electrically driven trolleys with the horse driven trolleys. Now why exactly was that? Was it just because of the availability? We're told that in places like New York City they had to forbade horses from moving around in Manhattan because there was too much defecation. And again, looking at this picture, we see almost a conflicting account in the picture itself with the electrically driven trolley and then the horse driven trolley. Now, the other thing we always talk about is where were the vast stables for all the horses that operated in the cities at that time and made the cities operational because we're told they weren't relying on trolleys. We contrast this with the Watertown Historical Society or the Hysterical Society, as some of my contemporaries used to call it in Wisconsin, and we can see how they're supposedly laying lines for the trolley cars to operate, and then we see their current historic, I mean historical society, and yet we have lines established. So again, another conflicting account. There's also a lot of variance with the types of trolley or streetcars that we see, with different design types, and yet they seem to have a wide variety of capabilities. And I have to admit, I'd never seen the image of the snow removal trolley or tram or streetcar that we saw in Hurley. And then even other small towns, whether we're in Virginia or essentially anywhere in the land where you have these wires that were established rather quickly. Of course, then we still have the question in terms of the other older city photos that we've seen. What exactly were all the wires? Because some seem a lot more extensive than simply to operate trolleys or telegraphs. So, going on with the theory, it appears that the previous civilization did have an extensive mass transit system. Now, what would be the purpose of trolleys? Well, deconflict that with what's going on with the possibility of airships. Now, we're going to be exploring airships as part of a live stream exploration this coming weekend. But what would be the advantages of having a reliable mass ground transit system mixed in with an air transit system? What kind of capabilities would that give you as a society and a civilization? Also imagine if you had more advanced construction capabilities. And of course we can see in this image the unfortunate reality for the end of the great trolley or the streetcar in many American cities. And yet many of these look in pristine condition now even as they're piled for demolition, salvage, or scrapping. So it paints many different pictures in terms of what was really going on with the trolley. I also appreciate the fact that now we have a trolley that's essentially a bus and you can go around in St. Louis. Hmm, that building behind there looks rather familiar. I'm trying to remember where I've seen that before. Yes, they do have one that goes right up to the Basilica of St. Louis and I highly recommend it. It's probably one of the best ways to get around there. But we have maps of other great cities such as Buffalo which we've explored and we can see just how extensive and in-depth this transit system was. And Buffalo seeming to be a prime example of one of the great hubs or one of the great cities in the pre-existing civilization and it had a very well developed infrastructure. Even Des Moines, Iowa had a rather extensive trolley system and network of lines that ran through the entire city. Quite interesting given the rapid development of Des Moines, which we've explored quite extensively, and I highlight it to say that once again it's no exception from the trolley system that existed at that time. And indeed, many of the university and colleges had trolleys or electric railroads in the early 1900s that ran right up and through the campus, and there were numerous depots to where the students could rapidly commute from wherever they were living. What a novel idea! And how efficient as well that you could quickly move students around, even in small colleges such as the Iowa Agricultural College, now known as Iowa State University. And we're not going to be talking about any of the symbols that we may see at Iowa State University, but we are going to show that it's very clear they had an electric railroad. And indeed, there's still an old station there that's been converted to a student break area, and there's lots of lovely vending machines there. So we can see there are numerous examples of how the trolley operated. Now, it's considered a little bit of a link to a lost era in America, or the United States, at least that's how I'll say it, and you don't see as much in terms of reference to the trolley in Europe, although it is quote-unquote well documented that it existed there as well, and you can find numerous images of trolleys operating in large European cities. And yet, other images such as this, which seem to really clue in to how widespread the trolley truly was. 
it was not limited to the cities. It was in the rural areas. Now, what makes more sense to you? Are we to believe our official account that trolleys really did develop in the cities and then they just happened to get an electric trolley in every single small town, especially across the United States, to include Tame, Iowa, Hurley, Wisconsin, Virginia, and everywhere else that you could possibly imagine? Or is it more likely that we really have a pre-existing mass transit system of trolleys that were repurposed, reactivated, salvaged, and as the technology developed, or as the technology was rediscovered, or disclosed, whatever theory you want to go with, that the current civilization was able to reactivate them for a period of time, and that they used them until they no longer had their uses, and therefore they had to be discarded. And we'll find many examples in numerous images, and you can find in every historical society across the United States, that it is very well documented, the extensive use of the trolley, streetcar, tram, every city, every small town. But what exactly was the story behind the demise of the trolley, especially in the United States? Why did such an efficient and even, dare I say, a very preferred energy usage mass transit system suddenly become discarded, especially at the time frame it was discarded. Well, let's take a look at that account and see what it tells us. So we're going to take a look at an article from our good friends at Vox. Now, I'm not exactly preferential to doing this type of exploration, but I feel that highlighting some elements of this article will tell us the story, especially from the mainstream, behind the demise of America's once mighty streetcars. And this was written by Joseph Stromberg, May 7th, 2015, so about nine years ago, but he does provide a very good point-by-point -point account for how the mighty streetcar diminished. And gives us some figures here. Back in the 1920s, most American city dealers took part in public transportation, 17,000 miles of streetcar lines across the country. Certainly not comparing to the rail lines, but quite extensive nonetheless, and we have to wonder about that. Ah, uh, here we go. There's this widespread conspiracy theory that the streetcars were brought up by, bought up by a company, National City Lines, which was effectively controlled by GM, so that they could be torn up and converted into bus lines. And indeed, it's also a plot point of the 1980s film Who Filmed Roger or Who Framed Roger Rabbit. At least there was an element about buying up the streetcar there so they could build the interstate. But I digress. But that's not actually the full story. Of course, it never is. But it is part of the story. So is this a conspiracy theory that's been debunked, or is this merely a partially true conspiracy theory? Hmm. Once again, conflicting accounts in this article. By the time National City Lines was buying up these streetcar companies, they were already in bankruptcy. Ah, I see. So they're going to tell us that it was because of the needs and desires and the will of the people that they had provided them the automobile, which was quite affordable in the early 20th century, that it ended the golden age of the streetcar. And indeed, they recount in the 1800s how the animal-drawn streetcar lines, and there's nothing questionable about that, were across the United States. And we're not even going to talk about the ones in the small towns because they just don't count. We'll just highlight some of the larger ones in the city. And what's also interesting in this article is that it talks about some major depots that we don't think about as mass transit cities, such as Atlanta. I guess they'd never heard of Marta in Atlanta, which moves a paltry 50 million people every year. Oh, well. The decline of the streetcar after World War I, when cars began to arrive on city streets, is often cast as a simple choice by consumers. Of course, what else would it be? As a Smithsonian exhibition puts it, Americans choose another alternative, the automobile. The car became the commuter option of choice for those who could afford it, and more people could do so. Now, how exactly was it more people could afford the car? Well, we know the official story because Henry Ford came up with the rapid assembly line process because we never had the assembly line process before, you know, except, of course, for when they did at that uh, massive armament in Venice that we looked at from, oh, about a thousand years before Henry Ford came up with it. But let's forget about that. It doesn't count. And then what was the real issue? The reality is more complicated. People weren't choosing to ride or not ride in some perfect universe. They were making it in a messy real-world environment. Well, isn't it always a messy real-world environment? That just seems like an excuse. The real problem was that once cars appeared on the road, they could drive on streetcar tracks, and the streetcars could no longer operate efficiently. Once just 10% or so of the people were driving, the tracks were so crowded that the streetcars weren't making their schedules, Norton says. Ah, 
In some places like Chicago, streetcars retained dedicated rights away and they survived. Pretty much anywhere else, they were doomed. With 160,000 cars cramming onto Los Angeles streets in the 1920s, <laughs> and how many cars do we think are cramming on there now in the 2020s, mass transit riders complained of massive traffic jams and hour-long delays. And so, once again, it seems as though, yes, this change in transportation systems, and you can even find Dean Kamen talking about this when he was inventing the Segway, lamenting the fact that our last mile to, trans or to travel within point A to point B in cities is broken, because of these cars. What's more, in many cities, the streetcar's contracts required them to keep the pavement on the road surrounding the tracks in good shape. So wait a minute. What they're saying then is that basically there was regulation that hamstrung all of these streetcar companies or these trolley companies and paying for the maintenance got more and more difficult and they were also locked into a five cent fare, which wasn't indexed to inflation. Wait a minute. Why in the heck would any company that's even trying to maintain its basic operation not factor in inflation at any point in time unless we're to believe that inflation was not an issue in the distant past very strange after world war one the value of five cents plummeted but streetcars had to get approval from municipal commissions for any fair hikes oh so regulation so isn't it interesting how the government only in chicago do they impose regulations so the streetcar could actually not be interfered with by the automobile and yet everywhere else the automobile made the streetcar impractical of course the automobile also makes itself impractical with all the vast gridlock you ever try driving around los angeles anytime between nine to five on any given day to include the weekends and let's not even talk about the 405 or the 210 and isn't this intriguing? The public had little sympathy for the traction magnets who'd entered into these contracts. Today, many progressives and urbanists are boosters of streetcars, but back then they were often seen as a bastion of corruption, you know, because the railroad wasn't and automobiles were certainly not seen as a bastion of corruption, at least not in the 1920s. Ah, uh, there's always an excuse for it, isn't there? Especially because of their owner's history of violent strike breaking. Mm, yes, of course. The quiet death of the streetcar. Because of these factors, some streetcar companies began going into bankruptcy as early as the 1920s, even though the article starts by telling us that was the heyday, but whatever. Again, conflicting accounts. Isn't it also intriguing that as they fought to stay alive during the Great Depression, many companies invested in buses, which were cheaper and more flexible. Hmm. Initially, they operated mainly as feeder systems, bringing commuters to the end of lines, but as time went on, they began to be replace some lines entirely. So it seems as though we have this account that, in reality... The way they developed the system with automobiles and the facilitation of the system by government, it was designed to remove the trolleys. Now, is that a conspiracy theory? No. The article tells tell us it's simply because it was the will of the people. The will of the people to have an automobile. And I'll be honest with you all, I'm a great fan of the automobile. I appreciate driving around in my car, especially on a nice county road and being able to go as fast as I want to. Okay, well, within the speed limit, but you know what I mean. You, you have the ability to rapidly move around. But yet, whenever you go into a city, <laughs> you may as well be walking, especially if you're anywhere in Los Angeles, Chicago. You know, it just doesn't work. I mean, Dean Kamen wasn't lying. He was absolutely right when he said the last mile in the city was broken. So what killed the streetcar? The simplest answer is that it couldn't compete with a car on an extremely uneven playing field. Oh, okay. You see, there's always a simple answer. It's not a conspiracy theory. It just couldn't compete with a car and the people exercised their will. And let's not even talk about where the car came from or how it could have mixed with the trolley. Imagine if the government had actually imposed regulations across the nation in all the cities where they retain the trolley or the streetcar or the tram. How different would things have been? But what's your opinion? I would love to hear it in the comments. What do you think the trolley, the streetcar, or the tram originally was? And why do you think we don't have the streetcar today, even though we have a focus on restoring and installing cleaner energy? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to stay, but...
Welcome to the Restituto Orbis channel, and today we'll be exploring railroads, America's greatest miracle. We often search for explanations in how it was the United States and Canada managed to build such extravagant nations when nothing existed there in the 19th century, and railroads provide us with a simple explanation. Imagine yourself going down a railroad in the 19th century, and you come across these incredible edifices, especially in Canada where they put such effort into building grand hotels that strangely enough resembled castles. Incredible castles with wondrous turrets and many arches and buildings that seem to exceed the imagination. Or chateaus, as they're also known as in the French-speaking area. Let's look at the timeline of the United States railroads. 1797, the steam locomotive was invented in England. 1823, the first public railway in England. 1827, the first railway in North America made by merchants. In 1840, rail expands 2,800 miles in the United States. In 1850, they were up to 9,000 miles. So in 30 years, 9,000 miles of railway. 1862, transcontinental railway construction begins. It'll link California. The Civil War occurs. And then in 1863, they set the gauge. 1869, the Golden Spike, making the first transcontinental railroad, and by 1881, merely 50 years later, they had 100,000 miles, and in 1886, something miraculous happened. When we look at the United States and we can see the map of how rapidly the railroads expanded, the first railroad in 1829, and by 1880, they had 100,000 miles of railroad. And here you can get a little bit of an idea in this map. This is a stunning, miraculous achievement because these were the highways of their time. And a lot of people will say, well, this was easy to do because to build a railroad, all you have to do is just lay the tracks and then drive in the spikes. Of course, you also have to tunnel through mountains because you can't go up a very high slope on a railroad, and you also have to build very large bridges to keep them as level as possible. So there's a lot more that goes into this than simply constructing a railroad. However, we also have to consider some of the construction challenges at the time because we're told that different railroads, especially in the south of the United States, had a different gauge. In other words, the width between the two, two tracks. Here in this legend, we can see that many of the tracks in the south of the Confederacy had a five-foot gauge. And on top of all that, they constructed the Transcontinental Railroad, 1,928 miles linking the United States through varied terrain. And I can assure you that when you go across the Rockies, there was a lot of elevation changes. Now, they had a crew of... Tens of thousands, Chinese, Irish, and other immigrants, and as we're told, the immigrants to the United States were capable of stunning achievements, especially when you were willing to pay them and send them to remote areas. They even had Tom Cruise helping them until he jetted off to go to Oklahoma. This is the individual who's responsible for the railroads, Grenville Dodge, and he was supposedly a spy master during the Civil War and a railroad genius. Here he is briefing President Lincoln in 1859. He also got into a fist fight with one of his subordinates during the Civil War when he was a general. Ah, uh, yes, United States Civil War, where they had time to get into fist fights and pose for pictures. And here he is shaking the hand once the Transcontinental Railroad is completed, and here's a picture of him later in his life, where it looks like he still wants to punch somebody. I guess he never lost that desire to do so. We start with very modest steam engines when we look at the original ones from the early 19th century. We see that many of these steam engines were very small, and... This is something that it looks like you could easily transport this on a ship. We're even told that the original steam engines were built in England and then transported across the Atlantic to the United States. Apparently that was a very easy achievement at the time, until the United States developed and built its own steam engines and then developed its own railroad. So despite the fact that the United States came to the game a little bit late, they still managed to build more track than the rest of the world by the 1850s. A very stunning and miraculous achievement and certainly one that we have to take at face value. When you look at these different rudimentary steam engines, you realize that they started off very small and very modest. And you think about how something that was not even proof of concept or attempted at that time quickly developed into large steam engines. And here we see one of the rotunda buildings that we see in many of our bird's eye views that we look at in explorations. And of course the Civil War where they managed to trail around large mortars that apparently had nuclear tipped shells on them that enabled them to burn large cities in the south and even in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania when the south raided the north. And here we see a steam engine that's exploded. It's an intriguing concept when we realize that there were so many aspects that went into the railroad. And it also led to the destruction of the buffalo. At least that's what the official story tells us and here we see this large pile of buffalo hides. 
So, much of America being built around the railroad, and consider the vast infrastructure that was required. Oftentimes, they had to dig large tunnels, and here we see masonry construction to support those tunnels. So, it wasn't just laying the railroad, an impressive enough achievement for thousands, tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands of miles. It was also building all this incredible masonry construction. Everywhere you look, these tunnels. Tunnels that oftentimes had to go through large granite mountains. Tunnels that had to remain level along with the stunning bridges that they constructed to support the weight of these trains and all the cars that they pulled as they went over them. Of course, they put the year on these tunnels because it's important to know when they were constructed. And we have many photos that show the wonderful congregations around the trains and this achievement in building a nation with the railroads. This was something that supposedly gave the United States a great advantage. And there's a lot of myth that it comes into when we consider the quote-unquote Old West or the ancient West, as they say in some science fiction publications. Of course, you'll see a darker side with it. There were a lot of reports of forced labor and vast corruption. There's even a book about Grenville Dodge, the genius who pioneered the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, being somewhat corrupt. You also have many of these elaborate structures that accompany the railroad, such as this terminal, it seems, beautiful masonry construction, and yet also innovative methods of unloading coal and construction materials on bridges that look like they've been in existence for a long time. Of course, we'll be told that was rustication. There are some pictures of some more rudimentary railroads, where it doesn't look like they even had full cross tiles, and one could see that the gauge on that railroad would be a little bit easier to change, potentially. And then, of course, we have these strange photos of the construction train, where people such as Tom Cruise rode and then prepared to construct new aspects of the railroad. We even have bridges that were made entirely out of wood, an interesting premise. And then, of course, we have our stone bridges, and it's even stated on the railroad official history that the stone bridges wouldn't burn in fire. I guess I never heard of the city fires. This is the Kate Shelley Bridge in Boone, Iowa, and when it was constructed in the early 20th century, it was the longest and tallest two-rail bridge in the world. Of course it would be, and in Iowa, where else would it be? And you can see that we have some very convincing construction photos, so there's no reason to ask more questions about this. There are many large and long stone bridges across many places in the United States that still exist to the day. And when mixed with these tunnels, it's an impressive achievement that not only did they build the railroads, but they managed to build the infrastructure to support the railroads. From 1829 to 1880, they built 100,000 miles of railroad. They built the tunnels, and then in Canada, they even built their own transcontinental railroad and very impressive hotels that resemble castles resemble very pretty castles that look like something out of a fairy tale land or even a castle that you call a chateau that really looks like it's out of a fairy tale land because why wouldn't you and the interiors are no less impressive with vast columns and pillars and beautiful decorations because if you're staying in a railroad hotel you need to have the greatest opulence and luxury as you've seen in many of the union stations that we've looked at in our city explorations on this channel no expense and detail spared, and only the finest luxury for those traveling the railroad in the 19th and early 20th century. And yet there are so many questions that we have with many of these early photos that indicate how far and how fast the train expanded across the United States and Canada. And of course we'll see construction crews that don't particularly appear to be very busy, but perhaps it was like the Civil War, they just caught them during break time and snapped a photo. And that was also between fist fights. You have many different interesting photos, though, that show elaborate structures and infrastructure that support the railroad. These buildings that seem out of place. The evolution of the steam engine. And then you look and compare that with some of the footage that we have that shows them ramming steam engines into each other in the early 20th century. It's an intriguing juxtaposition of considerations, and yet the railroad was the means, the primary means of transportation infrastructure that allowed the United States and Canada to become the nations they are. And now we look at the 1886 miracle. In 1886, the track gauge in the South United States was at five feet, and it needed to be reduced to four feet, eight and a half inches. There was exactly 11,500 miles of track needing to be changed to this standard gauge. And this map shows you all the tracks in what was formerly the Confederate States of the United States. The change was planned to occur from May 31st to June 1st, one single day. In 36 hours, tens of thousands of workers moved the track to the new gauge. Consider this. One side of track for 11,500 miles. One of the most stunning and momentous achievements. They planned it for months, but still had to execute it in 36 hours. 
So just think on that. In the 19th century, with preparation, you can move track for 11,500 miles in 36 hours. Now watch out. Here comes the 18th century. We'll do it for you in 36 minutes. Just consider this. Stunning achievements of the past. And this was done without disruption or notice. In fact, there's no documentation of this. There are no images of moving the track. It happened so fast. You just have this drawing. What do you think of this miraculous achievement? Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the live stream, Astounding Airship Photos on the Restituted Orbis channel. I'm your host, Lucius Aurelian, and thank you for joining me. So I thought we would just take the opportunity to really enjoy looking at some uh, airship photos and really enjoy exactly all that they have to offer. So you could say that we're going to do some exhibitionary uh, photo viewing a little bit. Now, we're going to look at all types of airships, and we're going to see many different aspects of what they have to offer. And we're also going to see how they could have possibly linked back to a previous civilization. And there are some interesting photos that a lot of people haven't seen that I managed to scrounge up for this particular live stream. So I hope you enjoy. And as always, go ahead and feel free to make your comments as we go. Let me know if you have any recommendations for other photos you'd like to see. And if you enjoy this particular live stream, certainly let me know as we go. And we can definitely do another one. So we're going to start with the Graf Zeppelin right here. Now, of course, we know the difference between the rigid airship and the blimp, the rigid airship being what we see with the Graf Zeppelin and then the blimp being more of the balloon. Hey, warrior class, good to see you. But I found this picture rather interesting because it shows the Graf Zeppelin going over Davenport. Hey, Isaac, good to see you. Hey, Kitch, welcome. Yeah, exactly, Sky Sage, and welcome, Sky Sage. Good to see you, good to see you. Thanks, RB, I appreciate that. We're going to start the night off well. Hey, Angel Luck, good to see you. So what we know about airships is that we believe they were the primary transit or primary transportation device of the previous civilization. I mean, if you think about it, you've got an airship, you can go anywhere at any point in time. You're not limited by the ground. You're not limited by where you can and can't go. And what's really intriguing to us about the airship is the fact that you can land essentially anywhere. You can go on a tower anywhere. You can go to a large church, a large building, or at least what we think of as a church today. And when you go to it, you can actually land or connect to it. And we have a lot of images that indicate that. So the Graf Zeppelin, famous because it made that rapid traverse around <laughs> the globe, the world, the lands, or so we're told. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. And by the way, CK Malcolm, it's good to see you. And uh, for those of you who made your uh, six-month anniversaries, essential welcome. So it's really good to see everybody. Yeah, you're right, Scotty. It is the best way to fly. And it was considered a real way to fly at that time. It was considered luxurious. It was considered easy, but we're going to see everything. We're going to see the luxury. We're going to see the aspects of the airship that made it something that seemed to be a bit of a novelty. And yet there are many clues behind it that show us it could have been so much more. So well, I'm glad everybody is starting off the night so happy. And again, special thanks to Rebecca. So thank you for that, Rebecca. So here's one of the otter type of airships. Now, I'm going to be honest, I didn't do all the research behind every single one of these photos. I just looked up some of the details because I thought we would look at some of these airships. And there's a great question right there from I'm Kairos. We honestly don't know. In fact, when you brought up the whole account with the Graf Zeppelin going around the lands, around the world, or however you want to say it, there's conflicting accounts on that. Did it take about a month? Did it take 21 days? There's even some rumors that said that it took 24 hours. Now, that seems very fantastic. You know, I think it's important that we question everything. Hey, Officer Donut, good to see you. And Jamie brings up a good point, the helium fast, or fiasco. And that's something that came up with the whole concept that, let's be honest, we've been indoctrinated. And I'm going to use that word very directly. 
that airships are dangerous. You know, whether it's the Hindenburg explosion, which just happened to have a camera there to record it in the 1930s of all times. Or if you've ever watched a little 1970s movie directed by John Frankenheimer called Black Sunday, where they attacked the Super Bowl with a Goodyear blimp. I'm not joking. They really made a movie in the 1970s where they attacked the Super Bowl with a Goodyear blimp. And you see people running scared from the blimp. So, yeah. Hey, Tartarian prog rocker. I want to make sure I said hello to you. So, yeah. But what are your thoughts on this uh, initial image that you have with this very unique looking airship blimp or balloon? They're all the same, you know, for airship, we're including all uses because, you know, as I am Cairo said, we don't know the exact capabilities. We can speculate. But, oh, yeah. Isn't that funny, Tracy? Good call out there. Oh, yeah. You're right, CK Malcolm. You're right. We'll take a look at one towards the end. And honestly, they've never really gone away. It's just how they've gone about using them over the years is what's really changed. So, oh, good one there, Hairless Primate. Yeah, the 1890s mystery airship flap. And it wasn't just one airship. They said they saw airships all over the place. Yeah, isn't that funny, Adam Bomb? Good point on that one. You know, with the 1970s movie, you'd think Goodyear would be done, but they made the proper marketing choice of allowing the film to use their blimps, but then they had to remove the Goodyear name from it. So if you watch that movie, you won't see it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, Kitsch, yeah, good point. No, and, and you'll see that, RB. You'll see that there's a couple that look a little bit more aerodynamic. So, oh, yeah. Oh, well, welcome, Marilyn. Glad you could catch one. Thanks, A-Belt. Good to see ya. Well, and that's a good question, too. And it's very interesting how they seem to control this technology a lot more tightly than we've seen in the past. Okay, look, you know I had to include a picture of an airship next to the Iowa State Capitol. Okay, I know you're laughing at me. You say, really, you need to get some help. You need to get some help to get away from the Iowa State Capitol. I get it. But I couldn't help but notice that they had a picture of a unique airship next to my favorite dome. Now, what do you think of this uh, smaller model that we have here? And good to see you, Jay, man. Welcome. And, you know, and you have so many different dimensions behind these. I mean, these things could be gigantic, one being 700 feet long. I think that was the R101 from the United Kingdom. And then you got small one to two person airships like this. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, and then suddenly that uh, cupola up at the Iowa State Capitol, which, by the way, does still have a stairway that goes to it, although you can't access it. Suddenly that makes a lot more sense if that's a docking port for airships, doesn't it? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Look, I'm going way far away from it this next week, okay? There's not really going to be any mention of it aside from some comparisons in these next explorations. So you make a good point. I definitely need help. I admit it. <laughs> well, thanks, RV. I appreciate that. Hey, Songbird Collage Arts, good to see you again. Hey, M1, welcome. Hey, Daniela, welcome. Good to see you. Yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. But, you know, a lot of these images do seem to have certain issues with them. So we have to wonder about that one. But I found it interesting that someone was bothering to do an airship demonstration, you know, over Iowa. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's a good point, New West Reset. They might not have been, but there are accounts that some of them were. So, again, it's hard to say. It's hard to know for sure. Hey, Shell Bell, good to see you. Oh, yeah. That, and get used to that, Ed. You're going to see a lot of that in these upcoming photos. So, again, take that with a grain of salt. That's why I say photos provide clues, but they don't definitively prove or disprove anything. <laughs> yeah, from that video, something happened to Anyway, let's mention about that. So here's an example. This is actually a U.S. Army Signal Corps balloon, and this particular image, which I did dig up from some archives, we're told is from Des Moines. Now, how does this image look to y'all? Yeah, definitely coming into dock, I would say that for sure. Yeah, that's a very good point, Officer Donut. And the other thing you think about is that it solves a lot of the logistics quandaries that we've had, you know, if they had the ability to move anything with airships. Oh, yeah. Like I said, there's no shortage of them. So that's why we got to take all these photos with a grain of salt. Yeah, I would say that that's a high, high probability. But, you know, after looking at as many photos as I have, you start to question all of them. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you breaking free from narcissism. There's something a little weird about all of these. So, yeah, that might be the way to go about it. Dr. Diablo, welcome. 
Oh, yeah. Well, you know, and there, there's actually accounts of many different nations making them and experimenting with them in many different time frames, too. So, you know, it's hard to say. Yeah, the cargo airships. Who's, where is that info, Wayne? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like they may be, although we're not sure. I mean, that'd have to be some serious peddling, so. <laughs> I think so, Adam Bomb. That's what uh, they said in the actual diagram for this one, so quite interesting. Let's go on to the next. And here we have one of the more uh, famous images, although for some reason a lot of people don't see it, where uh, we have the uh, Graf Zeppelin about to dock with the Empire State Building. So, What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, stand back up. I think you're absolutely onto something with that one. And that's always something we have to remember when we look at these photos. You know, are we supposed to see these or are they just giving us something? <laughs> you're going to like one of the later images, not to, not to tease you too much with it. So, yeah, exactly. Yep, they're every Saturday at this time. Yeah, it may. It might. And a lot of people don't think about that aspect of it, RB, and yet that was the whole reason why they supposedly designed that entire extension on the Empire State Building. The whole point behind that was to dock not small airships, but large airships. Uh, what you got there, brother? Well, uh, we'll look at an image that shows that in a little bit, but it is a good question. You know, how do they board and how exactly do they go about it? So... <laughs> Yeah, good point. I agree. It would be much lighter to float. Yeah, we can't get too close to that one. There'll be issues. So Hindenburg. Now, here's an interesting one where uh, it looks like we see some different little balloons going on here. And I always like this one because I still remember that episode of Little House in the Prairie. So the front tip or they've got a little uh, boarding ramp depending on the type of airship. So different types of ways but this image is always interesting because like here get your ride you can either go on the airship or the balloon and it's interesting that they seem to be delineating and you see the two of them right here this is the airship and then this is the balloon so get your ride <laughs> well that's the other thing we don't know is did they have a greater technological capacity than we're aware of you know it's just what we don't know so yep there you go jamie good night john boy that's absolutely right <laughs> Yes, good one, officer, don't it? Lighthouses, any kind of tower that you can think of, and all sorts of docking towers that are all over the place. And they're a lot more common than we like to believe. And now when you think of these building explorations, this is how this is filled out. Because suddenly these building explorations make more sense. Why do they have these gigantic towers on them that go so far in the sky, especially at a time when it was supposedly difficult to build so high? Well, this is exactly why. So I guess for the low, low price of uh, a penny, you could get a ride on an airship or a balloon in this one. So, well, that's just it, Scotty, just like we did with the locomotives that we crash in each other. You know, it's all for a cheap thrill and make a little buck on it because it seems as though they just had a lot of extra technology. It doesn't give you the idea that they were really testing these and just designing these, that they already had this and they had these to throw away basically. So. Well, there's multiple explanations. Maybe not every building was designed for a larger race of people. We just don't know. It's a lot of theories. You have to look at the facts and see what makes sense when you extrapolate and compare everything. Oh, yeah. I think any one of those would be fun to fly in, really. Yeah, yep, yep. We can start that movement, you know. Maybe maybe even formulate a whole new party, the airship party, you know. <laughs> okay, there's my bad joke for the night. All right. Here's an interesting one over the White House, and this seems to be one of the uh, smaller individual airships, although this photo I could say might have a little bit more veracity to it. Well, that's a really good point, Sky Sage, and maybe it was. Yeah, I had a feeling. I had a feeling in this community it would be a very popular topic, so... <laughs> Well, and, and then it wasn't just uh, the Hindenburg, it was also the other incidents that they had. Uh, apparently, there were all kinds of airships that were crashing that got others grounded, but then they didn't document those supposedly quite as well. 
Yeah, and isn't that a little suspicious? You know, what do they not want us to see or what are we supposed to see? You know, can you take the image at face value? Well, Officer Donut, that could be one explanation. They also could have used any sort of thing from atmospheric generation to crystal power sources to all kinds of aspects. I got an exploration coming up here in the next month on energy sources that's going to go into a little bit more depth. Yeah, I think so. It definitely makes more sense than a spaceship, although it would be fun to be in space, wouldn't it? Or is air space? I guess air is technically space, so. Oh, gee, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we already did the video on the Mandela effect, so that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny, Jeff Kelly? A little bit of an overlap there with that one. Hey, Internet person. Hey, Ganja, good to see you. Oh, yeah, and they, they definitely used it as quite a good uh, information operation because they had the cameras there ready to go and everything rolled off with it, and so that was that. Here's another image of it. And here you can see uh, the inflation of one, supposedly. I always find these hangers very interesting because sometimes these hangers look like they're very makeshift as though they just threw up a barn around it. Or other times it looks like they put more effort and you have one of those really nice stone buildings or mason buildings. No, not that kind of mason, but, you know, masonry constructed building. I know I like to joke about that one a little bit too much. Did anybody see that um, less than stellar film, at least in my opinion, from the 2000s, Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow? Yeah, that was a rather interesting one. Yeah, well, and there's probably a lot of veracity for that theory as well. Satellites, very likely. And, you know, it's interesting because balloons do have observation cameras that are placed on them. I mean, this is well known. This isn't exactly any sort of classified aspect. So, hey, Corey, good to see you. Well, good to see you. And you're just in time for the good stuff, so. It was an enjoyable movie, okay? I'm just not saying it was a movie that, uh, you know, I went home and I felt like a changed person, okay? I would gladly take that movie any day over... Ne never mind, okay? I'm just going to get myself in trouble, okay? It was an enjoyable popcorn flick. How about that? That's just my opinion. If you like the movie, hey, all the more power to you. <laughs> you know, you come here and you deserve my honest opinion, so I'll give it to you, you know, especially since we're talking about movies. You know, we're allowed to do that now, apparently. <laughs> hey, what's our real story? Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Chassie. Good to see ya. What do we got there? I am Kairos. Yeah, you know, you go to a certain altitude and that does become very intriguing. So let's uh, move on to the next image. Now, this is a really unique one. And this is a really unique image as well, because it seems as though we have a little bit more of an advanced airship here. So definitely have to wonder about this one. And look at the design on this. Very intriguing right down to the fins and everything, you know, and I can remember back in the day when uh, I think it was John Levi did a exploration and he was looking at some of the airships and he compared it to that little uh, airship uh, vendor from the movie, the fifth element. Yeah, there you go. Officer known it, the French airship. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Jamie. It does look like a much more organic design. I fully agree on that one. More organic, more streamlined design, as though this is something that they had a long time. This isn't some kind of experimental vehicle. Looks way better than what we see concept cars look, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Pointy airship. Not cigar-shaped, pointy. Like I said, we're going to look at everything here. Probably info Wayne, probably. Although it's safe to say we wouldn't be allowed to see them. So Now, this is an interesting one. What do you think of this? with the hangar and everything here on the water. Oh yeah, the Ferrari, yeah, that concept. <laughs> well, was the material supplied or were they already found in a depot somewhere and pressed back into service? You know, kind of like the buildings were. Oh yeah. <laughs> Where do they ride? Do they ride in the gondola or do they ride in the actual rigid airship itself? It depends on the airship. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, it, this does definitely have a, a different kind of look to it, doesn't it? Imagine if you had an airship that could do both. It could be an airship or a submarine. Mm. Yeah, I'm kind of with you on that one, Scotty. I mean, could be wrong, but it definitely seems uh, good as a design as any. Well, if they came out now, Isaac, that's exactly who we'd attribute it to because, you know, it seems to be the person who gets a lot of technology attributed to him. <laughs> Uh, true, 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 true. 
Well, probably because they were more advanced, Corey. That would be my supposition. Hey, Dwayne, good to see you. Welcome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and everybody, thanks for joining us. Please go ahead and hit that like button. So, well, again, that depends. We've got some reports saying they could carry hundreds, others saying it could only carry a couple. Who knows? I mean, if you have a large, rigid airship that we'll get to, it could probably carry thousands. I mean, Look at the size on this one here. And just look at this photo. This is a very interesting photo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't get those uh, makeshift hangers made in, made in time, could they? You know? And isn't it funny how those are actually made of wood? You know, We don't really have uh, stone buildings or anything like that there. <laughs> uh, yeah, you never know. Well, maybe they did something else to them. What's our real story? And that's actually what we saw happen to the Hindenburg and some of the other ones that went down, unfortunately. So, yeah, it's a good consideration. Now, isn't it intriguing, though, how you see these... Uh, okay, let, let's not let our imaginations run wild here, but how you see these uh, subsidiary balloons here on the back. It's an interesting design aspect there. What's really going on on the ground here? I always love how there's somebody who's very, very well-dressed in this. Yeah, that's a good suggestion there, I'm Kairos. I don't wonder myself. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't it wasn't made for that size, was it? Mm, as though they didn't care. So it does give you that aspect. Yes, we're dealing with this new, very finicky technology. Let it scrape, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lab coat, Sunday best, you know, what else are you gonna wear? Yeah, don't they ever? Let's take a look at that. Like, what exactly is going on here? You know, we got the lab coat. We got the guy all dressed up. Ladies look like they're going to church, but they're seeing an airship. Very intriguing. And what do we got here? Hmm. Yeah, and, and it's the usual suspects, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with you, Dustin. I mean, it looks like they're just uh, futzing around with it, to use a slang term. We don't know what we're doing. We just have this large hangar and we got this really weird airship. What exactly do we do? I'm not sure. Try looking that name up and see what you get. I'm not going to spoil it for you. You get some very interesting things when you look up that name. So, yeah, you're on to it, Jamie. That's exactly what I'm thinking. And maybe, Melissa, and that's exactly why they look rather, how should we say, strange. So, all possible on these images. Now, here's an interesting one that we see uh, that's off the back of a ship. Now, according to the image, this was taken from the back of a cruise ship, I do believe, at the time. So, I don't know. Maybe this was a way that you could have uh, gotten off the Titanic on time. <laughs> Jump on the emergency escape airship or balloon and off you go. Let's see if I can get closer on this one to give you a better look at the cupola. I mean, it looks like you could fit a few people there, although I'd say we got two very clearly in there. I might be not seeing that properly, but rather interesting on this one. Definitely not your traditional full cigar shaped. <laughs> Fly it like you stole it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's lots of libraries, Richard. I would love to get my paws on as well. But, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. And, you know, just like the buildings, the airships were salvaged as well. And I think that's what we got to go with. Oh, that's a good comparison there, Kathy. Who knows? Maybe that's where they got the whole logo from and everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it might be, Scotty. Well, you know, and Jeff, they tried to inform us of a lot of things. Just go back and look at all Led Zeppelin's covers and let me know what you see. You see some very interesting stuff there. A little different time frame, though, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, either that or they had founded so many of them, you know, they just had too much scrap and they figured out a good way to make a cheap buck. I mean, why else would you do that? So crash them together and have a good old time. All right. So here we have one appearing with uh, the old biplane. And doesn't this one look a little bit more advanced too? A little bit more than what we'd expect to be seeing. Good question, Eric. That's a very good question. You know, and we really don't have a very good idea behind that, especially the older ones. So well, what do you got there, Philip? Yeah, that, that could be Philip. And I appreciate that. And I think they did show a lot of indications of having a different energy source. You know, now whether that was radium energy, whether that was atmospheric energy, or even crystal energy, you know, there's all different possibilities that we could have had. So, <laughs> oh yeah, probably. This one specifically, RB? 
let's just say I've got some access to some archives. So you know, I can't reveal all my sources, but I will definitely post all of these for you to see on the Reddit if you would like to explore them on your own. Hmm. I'm not sure. I think it's some advanced material that we probably don't have now. Is it a rubber or something? I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with Officer Donut. It's probably a mix of canvas, rubber, maybe even something more advanced than we realize and we don't fully understand it. Now, this image has been through a lot. But this gives you a good front view of it. And this is where we see the traditional gondola. And hmm, aren't these guys getting brave here? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep, I, I've got an image of that too, I am Kairos. Good call out there. And again, something else that was featured in that um, very wonderful popcorn flick, Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. All right. I'm a Jude Law fan. Okay, I'm a Jude Law fan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good call out there, Jamie. Yeah, Kevlar. You know, and how long did we have access to these synthetic materials and how advanced were they? That's a very good point. Yeah, right, cross-threading. You, you know what? That would have been about as easy as trying to snag something out of the Polk County Courthouse. So, you know, they rough you up down there. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you, Worldwide Liberty. They very likely did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a very likely explanation is a multi-layer composite. I mean, especially with this one, you know, it's almost like you can see a bit of the canvas, but maybe there's a little bit more of a metal frame and that's what we'll be told the rigid airship is. But what's the reality? Who knows for sure. So, but good to see the rest of you joining us. Hey, Daryl, welcome. Yeah, and there's no doubt that something went kablooey then or exploded, you know, because it always helps when you actually have something like that. Ice and glass. No, I haven't, Scottish tart. Please enlighten me. Heard of a lot of different terms, so I might just be having a brain fart right now. Here's the graph Zeppelin on the ground. This is a good photo because it gives you a bit of an idea of the scale of it. Yeah, good to see you, Howard. Welcome. <laughs> oh, you guys are so funny. You know, and wh whether it was actually really witnessed or on film, I don't think it matters. You know, we were supposed to see the thing explode, just like we were supposed to see the good year, or I'm sorry, the blimp in Black Sunday terrorize people at the Super Bowl. There's a reason for it. You're supposed to be afraid of these things. You know, they're big, scary things. You're not supposed to find them as some sort of technology. Oh, yeah. Good one, RB. Yep, the last crusade. I got to say, Michael Byron definitely played the best antagonist in an Indiana Jones movie. He was quite interesting. Colonel Vogel. Good call out there. See, you guys get me talking about movies and then look what happens. So, oh yeah. Well, I'm glad to see we got people from all over the land. So yeah, it does, does look like the one from uh, last crusade though, doesn't it? Indiana Jones, last crusade, but it's really cool because it gives you the idea that these can really land anywhere and everywhere. It doesn't have to be a tower. They could just land in the middle of an open field. They could land at a small church tower. They could land at the tallest building and dock. It's very interesting, and I think that's what makes them very compelling to us. And we know we're not seeing all their capabilities, although I think we have some more hints. So this is uh, one of the very early ones, at least one of the very early images that I found. And this was back when I was starting exploration, so I thought I would share it with you just because it uh, showed up there. Again, it gives the impression of a much grander scale. In other words, that this seems to be a lot larger. <laughs> What's that there? I am Kairos. Oh, yeah. Yep, you got it. That's exactly what it was. And you go back and you look at it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And the United States military uses them as well. And that's hardly a hidden fact right there. Everybody knows about that. Hey, thanks, CK Malcolm. I really appreciate that. Boy, we're just rolling right along. Now, here is uh, the carrier that we referred to, at least an earlier version of it. And thanks, I'm Kairos, for calling that out. So, <laughs> yeah, you're right, Illuminating Manuscripts. It does. It definitely does. Yeah, they all got confusing after Last Crusade, but that's just my opinion. So, oh, yeah. That's another good point, Hairless Primate. You know, I didn't mention that because that was also part of the terror bombing, if you will. 
And so when they did that, when they used airships, uh, we're told that the Germans used airships to bomb uh, Great Britain in World War One. That was also considered the first terror bombing. Now, then there's conflicting accounts that say they weren't tactically effective. They had no strategic effect and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's all all very interesting when you take it all together. Yep. Planes are retrieved by Skyhook, an early version of it. You're absolutely right, Jamie. And maybe even by something we don't fully understand. You know, was this repurposed technology? Was this something they already had? Was this something that they innovated with repurposed technology? Not sure. Could be all the above. It's hard to say. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying them. And I will put them all up on Reddit for you to examine on your own. So did the legwork to find them. And I appreciate you all joining. So, all right, let's go to the next one. Here you go with your classic docking photo. Let's really get in close on this one. What do you think of this one? Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, it definitely makes me think, too. Well, true. True. You do want to have the good contrast, too. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and, and believe it or not, it's hard to find photos like this, Kathy. You can find a few of them, but to show this kind of detail and really show the people getting in and out of the airship for some reason, even though it happened a lot. So, yeah, that's true, Rebecca, or maybe they just didn't see it. Oh, I, I might have found a few. Okay, just give me a little bit of time. <laughs> that's it, Jamie. That's it. Hey, Heidi, thanks for joining us. Oh, yeah. You know, but if you think about that, you know, they had the stairway and you probably didn't really see the ground that much. I mean, it's actually uh, less frightening than just looking out the side of a plane, you know, and you're all about seeing exactly how that all lines up. Okay, so here's the money shot. What do you think of this one? I was waiting to get to this one. <laughs> it looks like everybody came on just in time for this one. Yeah, I'd say so. And that, that's what's interesting too, Scotty, because of all the weather they had to deal with. Now, hey, Paul, for Krista, good to see you. So let me tell you the story behind this one. Now, on the archive I looked at and on the caption, what they said was that this was a U.S. airship and what had caused this unique phenomenon was the wind. So apparently it was moored to the tower. Let's get close to the tower here. Moored to the tower and then the wind blew it up. And then it was in this inverted angle. And yet, when you look at this photo from a distance, it's in perfect alignment with the tower. <laughs> Good one, Adam. Good one. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're thinking ahead there, hairless primate. And that's exactly what this image is showing. Now, just imagine if they had that kind of control, because I find it hard to believe that this is just the wind and they had a camera there and they had a camera that just happened to catch it right as it was in perfect alignment with the tower. What are the odds of all those variables being in perfect alignment? Now, it's possible. I'm not saying it's not. But let's consider what this could really be showing us. This could really be showing us the ability of these airships to have precision maneuvers, attitude, altitude, and, oh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be fun, Rebecca? But just imagine if they had that capability. I mean, literally defying gravity. I mean, are we to believe it's just the wind or are we to believe that this airship had far more capabilities to maneuver than we're led to believe? And I think this image is a clue. Yeah, exactly, Corey. I think it's a clue that it's more likely that they had maneuver capability. <laughs> yeah, and you, you just really don't know. But I mean, you know, is it an image that's been altered? Maybe, you know, we can look at it as close as we want to. It looks like it's actually moored. but. Not sure. You know, and I know the obvious way to say is if I was there and I saw it, that'd probably be the only way I'd believe it. And I'd tell you, yeah, I think it's a fact that the airship really did this. But still, it's a clue. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Kathy. Or, or just think about that, you know, if you actually had a compartment that's in the top that actually maneuvered along with the airship itself and lined up with it perfectly. Yeah, there you go, Sky Sage. And it's on point, without a doubt. So anyway, I'm sure that one's going to be popular on Reddit. Now, here's one that it's kind of tough to tell scale on. 
and we have a U.S. Navy one, and we've got a very well-developed image. Some of the structures are intriguing as well. But what do you think about this image and then the shadow it casts as well? <laughs> yeah, get your seatbelt on, right? Breaking free from narcissism. <laughs> oh, look at that, Jason. Yes, gravity control tech with etheric electricity harvesting tech and stored power capacitors. Could be all. And it could even be that they had larger airships that are even beyond our ability to imagine. To imagine. Ah, there you go. Yes, 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 yes. I knew someone was going to bring up that nice word. Piezoelectric technology. Back when we did the Crystal Empire exploration. Yeah, that was a hot minute ago. Yeah, and it, you know what? It might be M1. That's why we have to take all these images with a grain of salt and why I'm showing everything because this is what's in the archives. You know, is this real? Is it not? We got a shadow. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, they sure did, didn't they? <laughs> you know what, Chassis? That would probably make more sense than anything. Yeah, no doubt about it. Who knows? We could be. Gigantic one. Ooh, good reference there, Jamie. You always have those great ones there. Yeah, Bioshock 3. Great point. Sky Cities. Oh, yeah, we haven't explored that yet. That's an upcoming exploration, so you previewed all into that one. All right, let's go to a better image then. All right, so here's your interior. You were all waiting for an interior shot. What do you think of this? Yeah, Last Exile, that's true. Yeah, never any shortage of Navy blimps down there are there, RB. They've always got them going. Yep, and uh, there was actually a Triumph album called Surveillance, and they featured some aspects of that. Triumph, the band, another great Canada band. <laughs> Good one, Sky Sage. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, and, and, you know, maybe the plans that Autodidactic had were probably more accurate than a lot of what we've seen. I think these things were a lot larger than what we realize. Yeah, I agree. It is awesome. I'll have to watch it again. Yeah. And, you know, maybe what we're seeing is just a cut down version for all we know. Yeah, exactly. Don't they? In fact, if uh, you ever saw The Black Hole, the film from 1979, it's going to be featured on our next uh, Old World in Films review. The USS Cygnus is actually based a little bit on an airship design, interestingly enough. So, oh yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So this is over Jerusalem, Graf Zeppelin, and I think this is a pretty decent looking image. You can actually see clouds in it. Got the dome right there and some of the other towers. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They could be very luxurious on the inside, and that's part of what they sold was the luxury. So it's amazing the variances that you have in accounts on them. Oh, yeah. Yep, I agree completely. You know, and I think when you see them over these landmarks, it definitely gives a lot of veracity to their existence, so... Yeah, you're right, Old World Hastings. And that's where we talk about the conflicting account with how fast the Graf Zeppelin went around the land or around the world or however you want to say it, or just went in a big circle. Did it take 21 days? Did it take 30 days? Did it take 24 hours? Conflicting accounts. Ah, good point there, Brother Adam. Very good point. Who knows? Maybe thousands. I always like this one because here you can see a little bit more of a well-developed hangar and a more of an advanced looking airship, especially with the fins. U.S. Navy again. <laughs> Good question. We'll be told it was the Zeppelin family and the Germans, certainly, although the U.S. Navy supposedly had some of the more advanced designs. So it goes back and forth. It depends which accounts you're going off of. So, oh, yeah. But yeah, go ahead and hit that like button, support the channel. I really appreciate it. Okay, so here's your uh, reminder from Indiana Jones and uh, the Last Crusade there, Rebecca. <laughs> I don't know. Why does it sound different? Rest assured, I'm the same person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good one. Well, you know, they had a little bit more time or maybe they founded something else that they could use and pressed it back in service. So <laughs> maybe, 
that's probably a good explanation as any. So we're just really not sure. But I would suggest that's probably likely. Yeah, just uh, send him an email, and I'm sure, you know, the next thing we know, we'll have the Tesla airship next year. Get your uh, 2025 model. <laughs> I'd buy one. <laughs> You're right, I am, Kairos, and we're told they were observation, interestingly enough, and they were also used for markers. Yeah, this is a little bit better of a quality one, too. I think I can appreciate this one a little bit more. Now, imagine the pilot climbing down to that. Now, that would have taken some uh, wherewithal. <laughs> oh yeah that's true Kathleen. that's true yeah it might be a product of that name we could get excited about right i think y'all are really going to like the floating cities exploration too there's no doubt about it <laughs> just uh slide down the ladder right into the plane like captain archer did on star trek enterprise remember when he did that when he slid down in the engine room uh, good old Scott Bakula. Enterprise is okay. Yeah, I agree with you, Andrew. I definitely agree with you. Okay, so now here we see a U.S. Navy airship docking with a ship at sea. Isn't this intriguing? And this is one of those other images that you tend not to see too often. Oh, yeah. Might have been, I am Kairos, and there were also plans for much larger ones where they would just actually land in the hangar of the airship, although supposedly those didn't materialize. Oh yeah, you're going to like that one. I have no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You know, who's charging who, though? Is the naval ship charging the airship, or is the airship charging the naval ship? That's a good question, too, and a good point. <laughs> yeah exactly much bigger yeah that's why it's one of those good images and yet it's kind of hard to find good call out there <laughs> well and then you think about the the usefulness that would give you you know whether it's for a civil application a military application it completely removes a lot of your logistical constraints that we like to talk about at least if we think about a horse and buggy society well if you have an airship and ship society and then you have trolleys and subways and everything else going every which way you have unlimited transportation capacity unlimited logistical capacity then you could build all these buildings now granted over a much longer timeline but yeah, suddenly it becomes much, much different. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Let's get a little closer on the ship, too. Very interesting. You know, some sort of experiment going on. It's hard to say. <laughs> Maybe uh, caviar. Relentless caviar. Who knows? Yeah, it was the uh, Philadelphia experiment with the airship. Wouldn't that be a cool story, Sky Sage? <laughs> nope, I agree with you. What's our real story? Probably a lot of real food in it, too. Great point. So here's one in support of the Navy. There's all kinds of accounts of uh, some of the airships they used previous to World War II, uh, in between World War I and World War II. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and they, they are still around to an extent. We'll see some here towards the end. So, yeah, pretty nice image there. It starts to give you an impression in terms of how far and how fast this went. So, <laughs> good one, good one. <laughs> exactly, just blurring, exactly. And those are all the kind of things that you can see, all the little tricks that they play and all the different dimensions of airships. It's quite fascinating. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, there, and there's plenty of pictures of those, Officer Donan. I know people have seen those because for whatever reason, they don't mind showing those historical images. But the rest of them, a little bit hard to find. So you got a uh, U.S. Navy airship going over Manhattan. And my question is, uh, who actually took this photo? Because I always ask that question. It was the tower next to it. Oh, that was funny when we did the cities, the city photo explorations. <laughs> yeah, there you go, PJCC West. Imagine if that's how the air cav got around. On rigid airships. Might have been completely different. 
Oh, yeah. Good old King Kong. I wonder if that's what got uh, my university video blasted. I don't know. Maybe I'll figure it out someday. <laughs> oh, there you go, Rebecca. Yeah, it probably was a drone shot. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Well, and who knows? Maybe that was how they disseminated a lot of the population, too. I mean, you think about it. You don't actually have these slow sailing ships. You have airships that can get anywhere relatively fast. You know, and if the 24-hour timeline was true with the Graf Zeppelin, and I'm just speculating here, then what kind of capability does that give you to transport people and materials anywhere in the land in a very fast amount of time? Yeah, Giant took the pick or King Kong was jumping really high. Good, good question, Info Wayne. We were just talking about that. We really don't know. Conflicting accounts on that. You know, I am Kairos talked about how they could have been fast as 200 miles an hour, maybe even faster. We just don't know. I mean, if you think about the possibilities of the power sources and greater power sources. Hmm, I just might. I just might. Now, this is an interesting early one, and you know, and I'm not even sure about the veracity of this image, but uh, the reason I pulled this up is this is one of the test ones that they were doing near uh, what is now the University of Northern Iowa, Iowa Normal College. Apparently, they tested a two-person airship right in the 1900s. Yeah, good point there, Jamie. Ride the jet streams, and then you can operate your jets right there. Really good point. And, and just think, if you're able to ride on those jet streams and you had more advanced technology, you could even go faster than that. So, yeah, it's a blurry one. But, yeah, I'm not saying I pulled anything out of the Capitol Archives. I didn't, but this was definitely not an easy one to find. Now, what's the veracity on it? Hard to say. There you go. Airship Cowboys, Scotty. <laughs> I wouldn't trust that to do anything because you know what? It's going to tell you what you want to hear, but that's just my impression. You're more than welcome to try it. <laughs> oh my gosh, the movie Slipstream. And you know who was in Slipstream? Mark Hamill. That's where we got to hear the Mark Hamill scream. And then we got to see the many humiliations of Mark Hamill from the movie Slipstream where he played the bad guy. Yeah, very good point though. Mark Hamill. Yeah, let's see. There was Slipstream. There was the Giver. Hey, Quantum Paradox. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, what else would you call it, you know? I mean, he got beat up in Slipstream. He really got beat up in Giver. We won't even talk about The Last Jedi. I mean, the many humiliations of Mark Hamill. <laughs> Ooh, Flight of the Navigator. Yeah, that's a great movie. For those of you who haven't seen it, that was actually a, okay, I, I got to retract myself here. It was a really good actual Disney family movie from the 80s, Flight of the Navigator. Highly recommend it. Yeah, good call out there, Eric. You noticed that. So that's why I wonder about the veracity of this image. Like, what's going on here? We got the phantom gentleman here. We got the really tall gentleman over here. Not really sure. <laughs> it's an interesting one. I'm sure it's going to get some fascinating comments on Reddit. Oh, yeah. Crypto Alchemist. Good to see you and thank you. Appreciate you joining us, buddy. Yeah, we, we've got the little uh, independent airship here in Iowa again, and we've got the giant next to it. So looks like a giant. I'm not saying it is. You know, maybe it was just somebody who had uh, a little bit of a condition that caused them to be much taller. You know, we can't jump to those kind of conclusions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, oh, there you go. Cloud City and Star Wars. Yeah, we got a lot of hints, especially in classic Star Wars. Yeah, pity they couldn't recycle that idea. Maybe they did. I, I haven't been watching Star Wars since 2017 for reasons unmentioned. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. There, there's all kinds of things wrong with this image. So, we'll go on to the next one. Now, isn't this intriguing? Does anybody know where this is? Hey, Jess Blaren, welcome. Good to good to see you, and thanks for joining. <laughs> you said that, not me. <laughs> so, no, sorry, Adam. You know, I had to get away from Iowa for this one. This isn't Iowa, okay? It's actually uh, on the other side of the pond, as a hint. 
So, no, not the United States. If there's anybody from Germany or Austria, they might be able to identify where this is, if that gives you a hint. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. M1's all over it. You are correct. It is Austria. Whereabouts in Austria? Ah, yes, Vienna. And does anybody know what that building is called there, that gigantic building next to it? Yeah, it may as well be the Vatican, huh? <laughs> It just might. It might have to do something with helium. I'm not really sure. Oh, yeah. Good call out there. Okay, well, I'm not going to spoil it because this building is going to make an appearance in an exploration coming up uh, this week. In fact, very early this week. Ah, it might be. It might not be. We shall see. We shall see. <laughs> No, unfortunately, the building is not still around. This is one that did not survive to us. Usually, I try to feature buildings that do. So, this is an image from Vienna. Yeah, exactly. Vienna hot dogs served on airships. So, ooh, mercury rectifiers. That's an interesting one. Now, we've seen this image before. This is in Chicagoland. Oh, yeah. And you might have seen some of these buildings before in some of our other explorations. <laughs> Not a bad guess there. What's our real story? No, they didn't try to sell that one as a high school, although they probably could have gotten away with it. I'll get around to that. Yeah, that's a good point there, Dan. Well, uh, when you get the story on on the exploration, it's pretty sad, Kathy. So it's pretty sad, actually. It'd be nice if it was still around. <laughs> maybe yeah we just don't know good old chicago that's right and here's another image of it and these were featured when we did the uh, chicago old world towers exploration yeah and maybe they were maybe they were Now they show it actually going behind the fountain here, so it does give you an idea of a scale. This is more of a real image. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's probably true there, Jamie. That's probably very true. Oh, yes. The city is amazing, beyond doubt. But believe it or not, there are some other amazing cities that we tend to overlook because of it. <laughs> well, thanks, Angela. I appreciate that. It does, it does. But what to make of it? Alderan. Yeah, doesn't it? Especially with some of those towers. All right, give me uh, one second. I'm going to step out for a minute. I'll leave you with this image, and I'll be right back, and we'll go to some of the real money shots here to close out the exploration. So give me one minute. I just have to pull them up. Going offline, talk amongst yourselves. Be right back.
Okay, I'm back. Can everybody still hear me? And on we go. Yeah, you should know that I'm battling a little sickness, so that might be why I sound a little different, so even I get sick. So, let's go on to the next image here. This is a good one. Another of the graph Zeppelin. You get an idea for its uh, length and the actual size of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. Well, and that's what it boils down to. So had a big temperature change here. So I'm just doing the best I can. Now, what do you think of this one? See, these ones where you have the airship near the water, they're kind of the rarer images to find. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no on-site exploration, so. Shh. <laughs> yeah, and those tend to be the harder ones that... Uh, that you can't find so well. And I had to search a little bit more to find the airships that were actually near the water. So yeah, float and maybe have all sorts of other capabilities behind them. So, oh yeah, without a doubt. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go on to the next one. Now here you can actually see what looks to be a little bit more of a built up hangar, but this is for the Graf Zeppelin. So who knows if they didn't find it in this kind of hangar. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's funny you bring that up, Albie Belt, because uh, Willem Dafoe was also connected with the Nofa, uh, Nos Fora 2. Yeah, of course. It's a piece of cake. Mm. I know. Sometimes when you look at these airships, you know, it's hard to stay focused for various reasons. So, good question, RB. Or did they carry something else? That advanced uh, geopolymer that we talk about in liquid format. Hmm. We're up here. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Or the design or everything else. You know, it's hard to say. You really can't say for sure, can you? <laughs> well, I try to acknowledge it because, you know, I did used to teach it and, you know, I can say that I didn't always love life. So what are you going to do about it? Now, here we have some interesting images because here we have the more built up hangar and it looks like they put some additional towers on this one. And I hadn't quite seen anything like this and I really hadn't seen an airship like this before either. So what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, probably, Beavis, you know, we just have to say they can and they can. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's funny you, you mentioned that, Willard, because uh, that's how they say they got to the North Pole was by jumping on an airship. That's literally how they said they made it. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Hmm. Let's not bring that up because you never know. Don't, don't be putting out any ideas. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's an intriguing looking one. You don't see ones that tend to look like this so much. So. <laughs> well, you never know. I mean, let's just say, you know, I'm not suggesting, but you know, just say it's a projection. You can go up and you can go tap it. <laughs> Well, there you go. Oh, Klaus Kinski. Yeah. What was that movie he was in? Uh, I'm trying to remember. It was called The Soldier, James Glickenhaus flick from the early 80s. Very interesting movie. Yeah, he played uh, the Soviet agent in that movie. Yeah, possibly. So they tell us, Brother Adam, so they tell us, although it's hard to say for sure. <laughs> Oh, this looks good. Oh, yeah. Well, some people just can't, Andrew, because they're very, uh, how shall we say, conditioned. And guess what? I used to be very conditioned, too. But there's hope for all of us. 
Hey, Lobo, I think they could have been powered by everything. We've talked about that a few times tonight. All different kinds of power sources. Here's another uh, interior shot for you. Now, this is interesting because you can see a little bit more of the superstructure of the interior, the classic rigid airship. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice, Crypto Alchemist? I think that'd be a great exploration. You know, we should get everybody together, jump on the airship. You, me, I am Kairos. Pick up old world exploration and we'll head on over there. We'll have some tea on the way. <laughs> We could even live stream from the airship too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's something that we notice on the interior of a lot of the buildings is how geometrically precise they are. So what exactly are you going to do about it or what are you going to say about it? Not really sure. I had a feeling you might be. Oh, yeah. New West Reset. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to leave anybody out. You know, I mean, honestly, all of us could jump on board. Every single alternative explorer that's ever been out there. Captain John Levi, Michelle Gibson, my lunch break. Everybody could jump on board and we could have a grand old time. Serve coffee cakes, coffee. And guess what? We could take all the rest of you, too, because I think there'd be room. And that's the point I'm really getting at here. I mean, just imagine how large these all are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could just do you know a, a 1000 person live stream <laughs> that, those are my grand dreams for the evening yeah oh captain picard okay good one because you know we just don't know how large they really were and yet you have images like this i mean there's really no limit to what you can think of with these things I always like this one with the motorcycle in the front, the U.S. Navy one. Now, what's the authenticity behind this image? I'm not really sure. <laughs> Good one, Jamie. Well, Jay, there's all kinds of population myths there. Yeah, that could be a nice long video, too. I could probably go on on that one for a couple hours. You also have to depend on what time frame you're talking about, too. Oh, you never know, Corey. I mean, it might be very relaxing and have a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah, I don't know who you're talking about there, my bailiwick zone, but that's okay. You know, we can always, we can pick up anybody. So, yeah, I had a feeling. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you, Jamie. It does look a little bit uh, dodgy. Supposedly it is, you know, and we had all those news reports of uh, what went down in San Diego. So that's fascinating as well. Yeah, I think you're onto something there, Crypto Alchemist, because it's a familiar shape. Yeah, and a lot of people feel that way, JC, and there's times that I feel that way too. And then I have that opposite side of my personality where I love to go climb high things. So just depends on the person. Exactly, Chassis. Oh, that was a while back. Maybe I'll have to cover it in a bonus on an exploration. We're still waiting for more facts to come up with it. Uh, some property that was randomly destroyed there. You know that story. Hey, Infinite Jack, good to see you. Well, thanks, OG Scotty Skid Row interviews. Appreciate that. Well, let's get on to the final images here. Now, here seems to be the closest that we have to a quote-unquote construction photo. Although, again, I'm not sure of the veracity of this one. And once again, this was not an easy one to dig up either. Can't imagine why. It's a recurring theme. You know, and, and it's not for me to say if you like flying or you don't like flying. Some people love it. I can honestly go both ways myself. Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I'm just thinking, you know, I'd rather just be in the car or walking or what have you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it goes back and forth. And I think that's just something that attributes to different people and their experiences. So, all right, let's see what else we got here. This is the R-101. This is supposedly one of the largest passenger airships built in the United Kingdom, Great Britain at the time. Can't really get a sense of scale, but it is a pretty majestic looking rigid airship. Now, this is the one that they said went down, or at least they pulled it out of service because they had a sister airship that went down in France, I believe it was. Oh, yeah. 
And so because of that, they had to take this wonderful airship, even though it didn't have any incidents of its own, out of service. You know how that goes. One little thing happens, so we got to ruin it for everybody. Seems to be a recurring plan that you see. <laughs> ah, I see. Yeah, isn't that funny? Well, that, that's pretty realistic, though. They don't really ever care, do they? Just go about their business. You know, even the horse doesn't care. Is there an airship over us? Nah, I don't know. <laughs> now, here's another one of these unique designs that you see at Paris. Called these dirigibles. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Adam Bomb, exactly. <laughs> well, and I think that's something they tried to put in our mind there. I'll reset when I'm ashes. Oh boy. Hope the voice holds out. Hope the voice holds out. Yeah, so you're seeing all kinds of new shapes here, not the old boring cigar shapes. <laughs> Okay, and now the last one. That image was just a preview from the exploration. Sure he was, Rebecca, and he had quite a wild imagination. No limits to it. Okay, now for longtime viewers of the channel, this image has come up before. Does anybody know where this is? <laughs> I think we know why they hide all this, because then all of a sudden the explanation about why we can't do what we used to be able to do goes right out the window. Two, it would be too convenient. Three... You can't turn as much of a profit off it if you have airships that go anywhere at any point in time. Yeah, power line in the picture. So this is a photo from a town that was called Berlin in 1911. And then in 1919, they changed their name to Lincoln. This is a town of 200 people in Iowa, in Tama County, Iowa. Now, why on earth would anybody be flying an airship, especially one of this design, over a town of 200 people in Iowa in the early 1900s? It's one of those things that defies all simple explanation. You know, and then there's the big how to do about why they renamed Berlin to Lincoln, because we're told there was anti-German sentiment in Iowa in the 19-teens. <laughs> exactly i am carlos and in a small town in iowa <laughs> well yeah i had to throw in a little bit you know yep vanilla skies you got some semblance of clouds but you're just not really sure on this one so yeah they went way off course kathy we're supposed to go from davenport to des moines and we ended up over tama county and somebody just happened to have a camera at that time <laughs> Yeah, that's probably the best explanation there. What's our real story? I'm not sure. There you go. GPS malfunctioned. Our satellite signal was down. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so now we're going to transition here real quick. Give me one second. And we're going to pull up some uh, different images. And these are the last images of the exploration. And you might find these particularly intriguing. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. I left out a couple. One second. This is a good one here. Give me one second. Because I couldn't get all these from one source. All right, so here's the R100 docking. Someone was asking if I had an image of that, and I did. <laughs> yeah, John Wilkes Booth. <laughs> good one. What's our real story? Good one. <laughs> Hey, Jimmy B-Side, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, it's parked. <laughs> and I just love how they have it parked literally in front of a hay wagon, as though somebody was trying to make a joke. Hey, look, it's a hay wagon. And then you have another one of these towers that could very easily be a light tower or just random towers that are just standing up in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, maybe they do. 
Now, see here, Marty, when this airship gets up to 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious, shall we move on? <laughs> yeah, you're right, RB, you do, don't you? Everybody see the little ostrich? Is it right there? Who knows? Maybe it's being towed by ostrich power. That's how that hay wagon moved around. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Here's a good one since someone brought up airships and pyramids. Yes, they do actually have the Graf Zeppelin going over the Great Pyramid at Giza, supposedly. Oh, yeah. Lots of micro dots there. Hey, Pete, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. I'm sure you're going to enjoy going back and watching this one. Just run that F-117 around that airship. No problem. There you go. And that's actually where it was featured, too. Yeah, I think that would make more sense than any of the other theories we have there, Scotty. I still love the floating block theory. That's always intriguing. Yeah, and this was not an easy one to come by either. I had to dig through some archives to find this one. Or as Randy said, you can just uh, look at uh, Led Zeppelin album covers and you'll see everything you need to see. That's another way to do it. Well, and you know, somebody actually uh, hiked up there to the tip. Isn't it funny how uh, you can see that the capstone is very clearly missing in this image, or it looks like it's missing, so who exactly knows? Hey, Angela, I appreciate that. <laughs> That'd be the best way to get it, honestly. Oh, yeah. Now, here is what we're showing now, and we're, we're saying that we're going back to the airship, and this is an artist concept of airships of the future. And isn't it funny how they look just like airships of the past? Yeah, the Zeppelin. Okay, so on that note of future, let me transition to the last set of images. Give me one second here. Because now we're really, really going to go out there. And just bear with me. Share screen, window. Okay. And can everybody see this one? What do you think of this? Now, what I'm showing you, this is not AI art. This is all art done by artists. There was an interesting movement in artists in the 1970s to depict science fiction, what they'll tell us are spaceships. But what's interesting is that they always show these spaceships in skies that are colored. In other words, they're not actually in space. Hey, Setna, good to see you. It's all good. Glad you could join us, and thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Yeah, the Black Knight Zeppelin. Good point. Does kind of look like it, doesn't it? But it gives you an idea for what things really could have looked like in the past. Here's another one. Now, just imagine airships like these. Could they have really been this advanced at one point in time? You know, are these supposed to be spaceships, or were these artists showing something that they did actually see? True enough. Yeah, an airship that's classified as a starship that's actually an airship. That's what I'm positing here, illuminating manuscripts, just to spell it out for everybody. Yeah, ding, ding, ding. And I mean, does that make sense? I mean, to me, it does. Yeah, if only. And granted, it's just a theory, but it's interesting how all those images that came out in the 70s showed you this. You're not in space. You're actually in the sky, in the sky that we can see with our own eyes. But could these have once been more advanced airships? Hey, Rory, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I still try to... I hate to admit it, I'll turn off my brain to watch some of the older ones, or, you know, I focus on the characters and the plot. What a concept. I know, I'm crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very much so, Kathy. And, yeah, we'll really go out there now, and then let me get to the some of the more advanced ships that you can see. But it was all science fiction art in the 1970s, but... They always depicted the ships, what they told us were spaceships, in the atmosphere. And what's so science fiction-y about that? You know, it was always something I questioned. When I was on the Paranormies, I remember talking about that. Yeah, exactly, Jamie. I guess you really can't. Well, that could be, Vincent. That could well be. 
Mm. Or underwater too. We just don't know. I mean, you think about the multiple uses for them. And then here's the final image. So here's what you see with the more modern rendered image of what it could have been, how it could have been powered. This is the total ideal. So <laughs> just like it all started with Da Vinci, right, Rebecca? It was all just imagination. Oh, do I ever remember Space 1999? And I also remember how good it was the first season and how horrifically awful it was the second season. Yes, it had some moments in the second season. But yeah, it went from being a 2001-esque high science fiction show to being a schlock sci-fi show in the second season. Oh, yeah. Ah, there you go, Jamie. Yep, Chris Foss. And Peter Ellison was the artist who was featured on most of them earlier. Oh, yeah, Elson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. You're right. Not Ellison. Elson. You're absolutely right. I'd love to stay, but 